Welcome. Good to see you guys here in Victorville. I know over in Apple Valley, uh, it would be good to see you if I was there, but it's good to be seen by you, and uh, we're delighted that you've all decided to worship with us today. I know it's been a great time already. If you need a copy of the outline, raise your hand, and we'll provide that for you. We uh, are wanting you to learn something sometimes when you're right. In addition to uh, listening, that impresses those ideas right there. So that's what that's about. So raise your hand if you need a copy of the notes. Had the chance to worship with the Apple Valley uh, group last week, and so that was fun. Boy, they got a good thing going on over there, I can tell you that. So we're looking forward to feeling in the fall and uh, what God has in store for that third campus that he's giving us the opportunity to launch in, uh, I think, sometime late September. Famous dead people who changed the world. Some of the greatest stories in the Old Testament are stories that we're uh, trying to resurrect for our series this summer. Used to be in uh, my line of work that you just had to drop a few names and everybody immediately understood who you're talking about, what their experience was. And so we could immediately jump to the application. I could say things like, well, you know, like Job, that's kind of how I feel. Uh, But now the audience that we address is far less biblically literate. That's not a slam on the audience. It's simply, I think, an accurate analysis, and that just makes our job a little bit more difficult, and it makes the sermons a little bit longer. Because now we can't fast forward to the application now without assuming that you understand what transpired in the life of Job, or as we will consider today in the life of Noah, uh, we have to tell you the story and then try to draw an application, which is fine, because we love to do this. I just don't know how long you want to sit there. But anyway, we're going to tell you a little bit about Noah uh, today. He is our theme. If you have your Bibles, you might turn to... Genesis chapter 6, and we'll pick up the action in verse 9, where it says, this is the account of Noah. So we're just giving you the account, Uh, not going to talk about the whole account because we don't have time. There are a lot of things that went on in this man's life that uh, could be uh, material for some great uh, messages down the road. We actually could do a series on Noah, but anyway, these are the basics about His story, verse 9 continues, he was a righteous man. He was blameless among the people of his time. He walked with God, he had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. And God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. And so God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people. Probably was a startling comment. He says, For the earth is filled with violence because of them, and I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. And so make yourself an ark of cypress wood. And it goes on to describe how Noah was supposed to make the ark. Now, you guys probably know enough about Noah and the ark and the flood. Boy, that was heavier than it was last time I was up here. Uh, And all that transpired with the two-by-two and the rainbow and the dove. And, you know, it's a great story. And I'm not here to minimize the power in the story itself. But I'm more interested, really, in the guy. Because God asked him to build this enormous ship, called it an ark. And I can only imagine God giving me that kind of a challenge. Build a boat one and a half football fields long and four stories high. <laughs> I'm thinking, what? what? Why? What? How? Over the last few months, a guy in Amsterdam in the Netherlands has been getting a lot of run in the press because he's actually built one, according to the specs here in the book of Genesis. And maybe you've, you've actually uh, seen a little about that or read about it, uh, been on all the networks. They've interviewed him. They've traveled there. They've, they've shown it on some of their broadcasts. Uh, and I have a few pictures. Uh, this is no joke. Johan 
Weber's is the guy's name. Um, I think five or six years ago, he built one half scale, and now he's built a full-size boat. He hopes to take it to the London Olympics next summer and show it around and, and maybe elevate the conversation about God and the scriptures and the story of Noah as, uh, as a way to, to get out his, his testimony. But it's really an amazing thing to just get perspective on what God asked Noah to do thousands of years ago. And, and so the guy is, is really our focus today. I mean, the ark is the ark. Big boat, what can I tell you? The man is, uh, is our focus. I want to tell you three things about him. First of all, I want to tell you that he was a simple guy. Now, that might be a simple thing to say. But I'm a simple-minded pastor, and I like simple things, and Noah's the kind of guy I like just because he's not, he's not flamboyant. He's not an eccentric. He's not on, on, on TV. Not that it's a bad thing to be on TV, but I mean, if... I mean, this guy is. He's not even Noah. He just built a replica. He's on TV. Uh, I'm not sure Noah would have been comfortable in that role. He was the husband of one wife. He was the father of three guys. He's just trying to get through the day without looking stupid. I mean, he's not the kind of guy that you would expect to be asked by God to do something really incredible. We don't even know what his vocation was. I have no idea what the man did for a living. I know later on he got into agriculture, started growing grapes. Until then, I, I, I don't know. I don't even know if he knew how to build things. For all I know, it took him three or four years to learn how to use a saw. I just know one thing, really, at least so far in this presentation, and that is what we read in Genesis 6.22. He did everything just as God commanded him. It's what he did. It's how he lived his life. You know, being a Christian, to kind of fast forward... Um, to our experience, if I can start to draw conclusions already, still early, but hey, it's a simple one to draw. Christianity isn't rocket science, you guys. You don't have to be too bright to be a good Christian. Um, you might be bright, brighter than some, less than others, I don't know, but it's irrelevant. Christianity is not easy, it is very simple. You just do what God says. And when people come to us because uh, life has imploded, things have gotten a little bit out of control, it always boils back to a very simple concept. At some point along the road, you stop doing what God said. And that's a simple idea. And even this week, you're going to have the opportunity to do some things that God said not to do or to not do some things that God said to do. And what transpires over the course of the week and how you feel at the end of the week will be determined by that very simple idea. I wish I could be more profound for you, really. I wish I could really plumb the depths with some of you scholarly intellects, but that's not how I roll either, and it's not how we roll. Second thing I learned is that, or we learn, you learn, you can learn. If you listen, he will learn. Number two, most righteous guy in the world. Blameless among the people of his time, the passage says. Now to say that he was the most righteous man in the world isn't necessarily saying much, especially after what we read about the world and just how vile it had become. I mean, being the best in a group of very nasty people might not be, you know, something you want to, you know, hang on your wall. Now, you know, I was the best inmate, uh, you know, at Alcatraz during the years, you know, whatever. I don't know. It's just, it's just you know, it's all relative. And, and he was blameless, but he was blameless among the people of his time. And, and we have to also remember, and, and even in, in uh, our story of Job, and, and next time we're going to talk about Abram and all of these guys, all these superstars, all these real well-known, well-recognized names, they were all sinful. To say that he was the most righteous guy in the world does not mean that he didn't deserve to die in the flood too. And Noah recognized that. 
The story of Noah is not a story of a perfect guy being saved while God destroyed the imperfect ones. The story of Noah is a story of a man who needed to be saved like everybody did and God chose to reboot humanity through him because he was blameless among the people of his generation. Genesis 8.21 says, after it all is said and done and it rained hard and the water dissipates and God says, never again will I curse the ground because of man, even though every inclination of his heart is evil from childhood. This did not change the basic problem with sin, the sin nature. Because when Noah and his uh, grandchildren started to repopulate the planet, they all had sinful natures just like the guys had before the flood. Noah deserved to be saved, you know, you might think, well, after reading, he deserved to be saved. Okay, well, maybe relatively speaking, but not absolutely. Because he was uh, a just man, and when we hear that he was blameless in his generation, basically what that means is he was not to blame for all the evil and violence that was out there. He walked with God. That doesn't mean, again, that he was perfect. In fact, when you consider the flood and you consider the rain, you have to keep in mind, this is the second flood of the story. The world had already been flooded with sin. So the water flood is like the flood part due. And Peter talks about that. Now again, we're talking Noah, we talk, you know, Genesis 6, but here we are in Genesis 6. Now we're going to go thousands of years into the future as Peter writes in 1 Peter 4, and he, he writes this to, to us as believers. You spent enough time in the past doing what pagans, pagans are uh, a descriptive, that word is a descriptive term of people who don't know God, and they choose to live in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. And they think it's kind of weird that you don't plunge with them into that same, watch this, flood of dissipation. And then they heap abuse on you. They make fun of you because you don't just jump in with them. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. And First Peter is, you know, there's the passage there is all about our accountability before God as well, much like Genesis 6. But the point I'm making is that here now, thousands of years later, we got the same old, same old. The Greek word translated that flood, the flood of, of uh, dissipation, it literally means a pouring forth of an overflowing. Think tsunami. Think northern Japan. Think of those visuals of that tsunami coming in like a flood and those poor people being carried away and there was nothing they could do about it. And, and that's a good description of the world we live in. I, I'll tell you what, when I read First Peter 4, I'm thinking, dude was alive yesterday and read the Times. But that's uh, what happens when every inclination of our hearts is evil from childhood. And that's the world that Noah lived in. And that's the world that Peter lived in. And no matter how many startovers God would have engaged that would still be the world that we live in. There's no getting away from ourselves. We're just evil. We just are selfish. We're just proud. God, we don't need to start over. We need to change our heart. <laughs> and that's why when Jesus came, he said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. And it doesn't matter how many times God would destroy humanity and start afresh with the most righteous guy he could find. The end result would be the same. But that which is born of the Spirit. Now you're talking. And it's the only hope of the world. It's how Jesus can change a heart. And, and you don't change by trying harder. You change by starting over completely with a new heart. And the old is gone. And look, the new has come in Christ. But that's enough application. We're still in the story of Noah. But that, you guys, is why Noah to me is such a compelling case study because he is us. 
He's a sinful man who is walking with God and he's trying to become the person that God wants him to become. And that's really key because the boat wasn't the first thing that Noah built. Noah didn't start building when he built the ark. He had already built a titanic life. And you can never undervalue just growing day by day and moment by moment and choice by choice and recognizing where you screw up, recognizing where you make mistakes and making whatever adjustments you have to make to get back on track. That was the story of Noah and that's why God called him to do this incredible task. And you look at his life, 500 years old. God was 500 years old when God called him to build the ark. And then it took him, you know, about 100 years to build the ark. And then he lived 350 years after he built the ark. That means he lived to be like 950 years old. I got a dog that's 18. I looked it up the other day, you know, on some dog, calculate your dog's age website. And in dog years, Madison is 120 years old. And uh, that's why I have rabbits in my backyard. In the old days, there would not have been a mosquito on our property without Madison chasing it down. And now she can't see him, she can't hear him. She can only she can only smell food. It's all she can do. It's all she's good for. And so I guess she has a quality life still. She's still loving her food. But nine. <laughs> 150 years. <laughs> See, it was at this point in human history when the average lifespan decreases significantly. And a lot of biblical cosmologists have tried to explain why it is that after the flood things change so dramatically in terms of longevity. And they've analyzed all the data, and we're not going to look at it today, but it's a very fascinating study in and of itself looking at the cellular level Um, issues all the way to astronomical events that took place right about this time that could have all contributed to that significant uh, demise of the human lifespan. But when I look at, you know, 950, I'm thinking, okay, let's just look at ratios. So let's just divide it all by 10. And then now you've got something that's a little more in the ballpark for us. Let's just say, I mean, 95 is still like Wow, that is really, really old. But the point I'm making is that if you live to be 95, this is how the life would break down if you were like Noah. 50 years building a life, and then God came to you at the age of 50 and said, okay, we're going to do something that is really big. And then for that season of 10 years, you know, you built whatever it was God wanted you to build, and then you, for 35 years, you know, you, you lived in the wake of whatever it was that you accomplished, accomplished for God. And, and this is my point. We can make a big deal about how, you know, Noah spent those 10 years. That's what we do. We look at the 10 years and we say, wow. And you know what God looks at? The 50 years. And that's why Noah got the shot during the 10. See, that's the thing about faithfulness. Noah did everything that God asked him to do. But doing everything that God asked him to do was the way Noah lived. A wise man put it this way. He said, you take care of the little things and the big things will take care of themselves. Let me put it another way. Um, You don't get to do the big things unless you're faithful with the little ones. You want to do something great for God? You got a great idea? You got a call? You got a vision? You got this, you know, this, this plan? which is perhaps as monumental as building a you know, 450-foot-long boat. I don't know. Maybe it's even bigger than that. I, I have no problem with anything that you believe God called you to do. I'm just saying. You take care of the little things, and you will get your shot. But don't worry about building an ark. Worry about building your life. You know what? One of the most important takeaways from the story of Noah is this. You want to be like Noah? Go home and love your spouse. And give your kids a hug. And don't get caught up in the dissipation of the world. And that's Noah. 
And then number three, uh, third thing, he not only was a simple guy and, uh, you know, he walked with God and, and he was a righteous guy. He, he was wanting to do the right thing in life. But he did something way bigger than he was. And so I guess now in focusing in on those ten years, which, you know, was the story. I mean, that's the headline. You know, ark completed, rain is coming. In the forecast, that's the real story here, I guess. But, but there are three elements to the bigness of this accomplishment. And it's really an interesting thing in a minute. I think at the beginning it's kind of like a, well, of course, we already knew that kind of conversation. But then later on it's going to get a little more bizarre, so hold on. First thing, uh, when you talk about he did something way bigger than he was, is he... There's the first point. He built a big boat, a really big boat. Hundreds of miles from the nearest ocean, he builds this monstrosity of a boat. And everybody who walks by and all of his neighbors that came by, and you can imagine their conversations, uh, you know, every evening as they're walking their dog and they go by Noah's, you know, place, his back 40, and they look up at this huge thing that's beginning to take shape and they're wondering what in the world are you doing Noah Peter describes Noah as a preacher of righteousness and that doesn't mean that he was a preacher by vocation it doesn't mean that he was uh, a full time missionary it simply means that when he had the opportunity to share his um, love of God he did so and so he explained this righteous God and what it's like to live your life in a righteous way and doing the things that God tells you to do and this is what God told me to do and, and it's, it's why I'm doing it. And every time somebody walked by, they had a choice to make. You know, Noah's either a, an absolute moron or he's onto something we're, we're not getting yet. And we need, to, we need to understand this. And evidently, everybody just thought he was dumb. They thought he was, he was just kind of a whack job. But he builds this really big boat. Now, here's another thing he did, because this raises the bar. He also led a group of seven other pioneers to restart the human race. You know what? As big a deal as building a boat is, especially at even a boat that size, this is bigger. I mean, he's going to be like a, you know, a new, a new Adam. No, you guys, just picture you and your wife and your three kids, if you have three, and if you have four, you've got to pick three of them, <laughs> and, uh, and their spouses being the only, the only people on the planet. There's no, you know, my grandson or... Youngest grandson prays every day, no bad guys. Oh, Lord, no bad guys. It's his prayer. Good news, Coke. There aren't any bad guys outside of this room. There aren't any guys. There aren't any people. There's nothing to worry about. That's a big deal. You know, back in 1995, uh, they began to examine... Our DNA at levels they never were able to examine before. And I'm just going to give you an idea that maybe would ignite your interest in something. So forgive me if this sounds confusing. But back in the, in the mid-90s, it was a Y chromosome research project. And it was a big deal. And they were able to zero in on a date for the most recent common ancestor of all human males. And by tracking your DNA, they can actually find between you and I, and if they want to get samples of DNA from all over the world, they can actually find a date for all of our common ancestor, which, of course, if you read the Bible, uh, that, that guy actually had a name. It was Adam. And so they come up with this date, and the recent, relatively recent date, and of course this is a a science that, like all science, is very fluid. And so they're still trying to deal with the ramifications of that research, and they're doing much more actually now. But the relatively recent date from that particular study challenged the possibility that modern humans evolved from another 
primate species, which of course set the scientific community on its ear. So they didn't know what to do with that information. And then it, it was further complicated by their realization that the date for the most recent common ancestor of all human males was not the same date as the most recent common ancestor of all females, which could have been as recent as a few thousand years earlier. And so now they're trying to figure out why is there a discrepancy of such breadth. I mean, thousands of years difference. And so while scientists are trying to come up with a rational explanation for that, you don't have to go any further than the story of Noah in Genesis 6 to come up with what I consider to be a fairly logical explanation. You see, we should be able to find an earlier date for the most recent common ancestor of all females than for the most recent common ancestor of all males because of the eight people on Noah's Ark. The four men were blood-related, but not the four women. And so the most recent common ancestor for the four men on Noah's Ark, and for all men since, was Noah. But not so for the women. The most recent common ancestor for the four women on the Ark, for Noah's wife and their three daughters-in-law, was Eve. And so here we go. It's almost like deja vu all over again. And we're rebooting the human race. Now, you know, Noah, I think, understood the enormity of the boat. And I, I, obviously he understood, especially when he walked off the ark with the animals and figured that, okay, it's just the eight of us. I'm sure he figured out the enormity of what it meant to be all alone in the world again. Or for the first time, but mankind being small in number again. But then there's something else that took place that I don't think Noah had any clue about. We need to fast forward to the next to the last book of the Bible to begin our, our consideration of this last, you know, how big was Noah's journey discussion. But in Jude chapter 1, uh, there's only one chapter in Jude, so uh, don't knock yourself out looking for another one. But verse 6 says, the angels, and this is a statement that Jude just kind of throws out there. The angels who did not keep their positions of authority but abandoned their own home, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. Now Jude's intent was to talk about our accountability before God. And so he uses a historical example of how everyone is accountable before God, including angels. And he throws this out there as if we would understand what he's talking about. But we read this about some angels who evidently have been given positions of authority that they left to do something else. And so now he's put them in darkness and he's bound them with everlasting chains even though the judgment on the great day has not happened yet. And when I read that, I think, okay, these guys, whatever they did, they were angels. And we know we've got good angels and they're out doing good things, as you would expect a good angel to do. And then you've got fallen angels, we call them demons, and they're doing their nasty work on behalf of their leader, Satan, and they're just messing with you and harassing us and trying to disrupt the kingdom of God, the flow of the kingdom of God. And so we've got the good angels, we've got the evil angels. But there is this group of evil angels that evidently did something so nasty that God said, I'm not going to let you keep messing around with my people. You're going down right now. And he locked them up. He locked them up prematurely. If you want to look at, you know, from our vantage point at least, it would be a, a premature lockdown. I'm thinking, wow, you must be pretty nasty. If you're so, if you're you're worse than demons. The problem with this passage in Jude is context. There is none. He just kind of throws it out there, and those of us who read it thousands of years later recognize that the audience that Jude wrote to probably had more information. And so when they read it initially, they they would have said, oh yeah, yeah, that's a good example of our accountability to God. But you and I don't have that luxury. We are totally in the dark on this, except what's there, which is why it's nice that Peter chimes in. And you look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, and he doesn't help out much. In verse 4, he says, If God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment, and then he goes on to say, essentially the same thing Jude said. He goes on to say, then if, if they didn't escape judgment, then we won't either. 
So that doesn't help us until we get to verse 5. And in verse 5 he says, If he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but he protected Noah, a preacher. I mentioned that Peter describes him as a preacher. A preacher of righteousness and seven others. And then he goes on to say basically the same takeaway. Then we're accountable to him as well. He's not going to spare the world now, as he writes, any more than he spared the world then. But this is the key, really, to the whole New Testament consideration of these angels that were locked up, were put in these dungeons to be held for judgment. The only help that they give us is context, historically. Whatever they did took place during the time of Noah, which takes us all the way back then to our, our story. And you remember in chapter 6 we started in verse 9? What would happen if we actually started in verse 1? So let's start in verse 1 of chapter 6. When men began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. And they married any of them they chose. And then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be 120 years. And the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. The Nephilim would have been the offspring of these sons of God and these daughters of men. So they were on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of men, had children by them, they were the heroes of old men of renown. So whatever offspring was created from this liaison between these sons of God and these daughters of men, they were pretty impressive creatures. Half son of God, half daughter of man. Whatever that means. I do know this. The Lord, verse 5, saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. And the Lord was grieved that he made man on the earth and his heart was filled with pain. And so the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I've created from the face of the earth, men and animals, creatures that move along the ground, birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. You know, you guys, I have oftentimes read the story of Noah. And I'm thinking, okay, God was grieved in Genesis 6, so he destroyed all of humanity. He must have been equally as grieved. I mean, how many chapters did it take mankind to screw the whole thing up all over again? Why haven't we got this restart, this reboot of humanity time after time after time, even today? I remember Billy Graham said one time, if God doesn't destroy the earth now, he owes Sodom and Gomorrah an apology. Why doesn't God do it time after time throughout the scriptures? I don't believe it's because of the evil just in the heart of mankind. I think it has something to do with the Nephilim. I think God wanted to get rid of them, actually. You say, well, who were they? Well, I'm not really sure, and I don't even know if we can draw a connect between Jude 6 and Peter's words and, and the story of Noah. I don't even know how much, you know, we have to read between the lines to connect those dots. But I will tell you, what would have happened if angels, fallen ones, had cohabited with human women and created a half-breed, half-angel, half-person race? What would that have done? What kind of a wrench would that have thrown into the plan of redemption, the plan that God initiated himself in Genesis 3 when God said, I will save mankind eventually? And then Satan and his henchmen go back to the drawing board to figure out how they can disrupt God's plan to save humanity. And while they're throwing all kinds of ideas on the board, one of those ideas that pops up is, what if we created a type of humanity that really wasn't human? What would that mean for the plan of redemption? Well, I don't really know what I'm talking about right now. But evidently, this was bigger than Noah knew. That much I'm pretty certain of. You see, my point is this. Noah found favor in the eyes of God. Noah built the boat. Noah restarted humanity. But did Noah recognize that he was actually restructuring the cosmos? Probably not. You see, when God gives us a challenge, after 50 years of positioning us, and he gives us a challenge to do something that's really pretty impressive, 
we have no idea what he actually intends to do with it. And our lack of understanding can paralyze us. Sometimes we don't understand what God wants really or what he wants to accomplish really and so we're just paralyzed in our fear and our doubts. Sometimes God sends a difficult season in our lives like perhaps he sent into your life recently and that you know bothers you and you don't understand why God allows that or why God calls you to be the only one in your particular circle of relationships to have to undergo to have to undergo that kind of an event, that kind of a season. And, you know, we come alongside of you, and as pious as we sound, we say things like, well, all things work together for good. And everything happens for a reason. And you walk away saying, well, you just shut up. (laughs) But you know what? God is at work behind the scenes doing things that are bigger than you think. You see, the fact that he would be obedient to build a boat is pretty cool. And maybe, if for no other reason, if I know I'm thinking, well, God told us to do it. My boys know that God told us to do it. And I just want to be a good example to my sons about what it means to do everything that God commands us to do, even if it sounds dumb. That would have been a great, a great rationale. That would have been huge. But to reboot the entire human race, for God to do a, okay, this is a a mulligan, this is a do-over, and to be called out of all of mankind that was alive to do that, boy, that was even bigger. But to make a bold declaration to the entire angelic realm that God is not one to be trifled with, and to be used by God to make that kind of a demonstration to the cosmos, that's huge. Three takeaways quickly. Here we go. Number one, if God decides to use somebody to do something legendary, he won't look for a superstar. He's going to look for you. So don't be surprised if at some point God comes up to you and says, smile, we're building a boat. And you'll say, me? What do you mean me? I mean, go down and, and find some huge you know, mega church pastors, some big Christian rock stars, some big celebrity. And you know what God would say if you told him that? He would say, are you serious right now? That's not how I, that's not how I do things. Number two, God honors people who recognize their need for mercy. You know, one of the most beautiful scenes uh, in the whole story of Noah is after, you know, everybody gets off the boat. What's the first thing that Noah does? You know, we focus sometimes on the rainbow. And I will never destroy the earth again. And the rainbow will remind you of my promise. I'm, I probably shouldn't be tri- you know, trivial about that. That was a pretty cool thing, too. God was speaking. But sometimes we focus on the whole idea of the rainbow and we forget what Noah does. He gets, he gets off the boat. He falls on his face. And he says, thank you, God, for saving me. Noah was a man who knew he deserved to be destroyed with the rest of the world, but God had, for whatever reason, shown him mercy. And you know what God does? He honors people who recognize, number one, that they need mercy and are thankful when God shows it to them. And God lifts them up. And then the third thing is this. God will do more with your faith than you can ever imagine. And so if you have the faith to get through whatever difficulty you're going through, God will use it more than you think. Way, way, way more than you think. You know, when I think about Oikos, can you imagine me thinking about Oikos? I think about your 8 to 15, and I think about the fact that every one of your 8 to 15 uh, each have what? An Oikos. Okay, I'm almost done. Don't lose me yet. Are you guys out there? Come on. Okay, so you got 8 to 15. Every one of your 8 to 15 have what? 8 to 15. And you know every one of the 8 to 15 of the 8 to 15 that your 8 to 15 have? You know what they have? They have 8 to 15. Do you, you go home sometime and just do the math. In fact, maybe I should do it for you on screen. There's no way I could do it off the top of my head. But I'm just telling you, that adds up quickly, you guys. And it doesn't take very many generations for your legacy to be established forever. 
because the fact that you would wake up every day and pray for those guys, the fact that you would live your life mindful of those 8 to 15, the fact that you would want to live a life that was exemplary, where you just did everything that God commanded you to do. And you didn't do it perfectly, but you just wanted to walk with God every day. And in heaven, there's going to be an awful lot of people who aren't going to be talking about the story of Noah. They're going to be talking about you. Because you answered the bell. And when we talk about Noah building a boat, man, we can talk about that if you want. But I could talk about all, what I could talk about all day is the fact that Noah built the kind of life that God could use. And he built it right the first time. And that's our challenge as well. Let's bow for prayer. Lord, give us uh, a Noah-like faith, but also that bulldog tenacity that allows us the opportunity to even have um, a chance to change the world by living a life that you can elevate in front of the people uh, around us and make us mindful of the power of the simple things uh, that we do to honor you. With everybody just uh, mellow for another second. We always seem to end our, our messages with a challenge to know God. Uh, Noah walked with God. He knew God. And uh, here at High Desert Church, we talk about establishing a relationship with God by faith. ABC, admit that you need a Savior. Admit that you're a sinner. As we mentioned, God honors people who recognize their need for mercy. And if you are one who understands that your sin deserves to be punished, if you'll admit that, if you'll believe that Jesus took the punishment for your sin upon himself on the cross, that he died to save you, if you will choose to place your faith in Christ, in uh, the fact that he died uh, to save you, to save me from ourselves, then you can know him. If you recognize that he sent his son because he loved you that much, and if you'll humble yourself and with a prayer of gratitude receive him into your life, then uh, you'll be on a new journey. And for you, the old will be gone and the new will arrive. And you'll experience what it means to be born again. And Father, I pray that if there are any um, in this auditorium, in Apple Valley's auditorium that don't know you, that they would respond by faith in the days to come, that you'd reveal yourself in an unmistakable way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.